Hi everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming. And uh, I see a lot of people here. Uh, I think a lot of you uh, have probably come to see why uh, someone is trying to uh, cut the branch they are sitting on. Why is uh, an analytics training company saying analytics training is dead? Um, so uh, is it because? Uh, yeah. So uh, sorry just getting the hang of this so is it is it because the demand for uh, data science itself is going down is it because the demand for analytics is going down i don't think so i think everyone here will agree that uh, the demand for analytics the demand for data driven thinking data driven decision making continues to increase uh, so so why why are we saying analytics training is dead do we not need data scientists anymore um, is AI set to take over uh, the, the entire data science piece and we don't need humans anymore. Uh, thankfully, we are, uh, we are quite uh, some distance away from it. I think uh, uh, that, that, that is something that's, uh, that's not going to happen anytime soon. So why exactly am I saying uh, analytics training is dead? Uh, well, let me, let me give you some context. So uh, when we say analytics training is dead, uh, what we are saying is analytics training as we know it is is dead and uh, what do we what do we mean by that uh, i'll i'll give you some more context so let me start with the first thing what is analytics training so when i say analytics training what what do i mean which uh, what analytics training is this so uh, a typical analytics training requirement that would come to us and uh, i'm talking about the last 8 years since uh, we've been running jigsaw uh, you know, uh, when, when a client comes to us, a typical analytics training requirement is that of, uh, you know, it could be a tool based training, it could be a platform based training, someone would want to uh, learn R or Python or, or SAS or, you know, one of those new platforms, uh, maybe, maybe get uh, familiar with H2O, with TensorFlow, uh, you know, so it could, be, uh, it could be any of those trainings. It could be a skill based training that the, uh, that the business is looking for. Uh, I want my team, my team trained on uh, text mining. I want my team trained on video analytics. I, I want my team to be able to make sense of image data or uh, audio data. So it could be a skill-based training, it could be a, 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 a tool-based training, but that is typically uh, what the analytics training uh, requirement is. Who is it for? Who are the people who are getting trained? Uh, well, typically it's, uh, it's the data science team that resides within the business. They have a set of skills and the business wants them to augment their skills and maybe pick up new skills. Uh, for uh, some of the companies that are, uh, that are just starting off on analytics, especially a lot of the Indian businesses, it could be the IT team which has been uh, working with data but now they want, want them to actually analyze that data and produce insights from it. Uh, so it could be the data science team, it could be the IT team, it could be anyone else HR finds uh, walking around in the, in the corridor and say, okay, if you have time, why don't you join this training? Uh, but that's essentially what we mean when we say who gets trained. And uh, where do they get trained? Uh, you know, uh, it, earlier it was all uh, classroom based training. They would, uh, they would be in a training room, they would be in a classroom and uh, they, would, they, would, they would get trained there. Uh, now with uh, teams get being more geographically spread, we are doing a lot of uh, online classes as well. So it could be a live online environment in which uh, the, the people are learning or it could be just a, a, a learning management system that they are working, that they are working on. So it could be self-paced video, self-paced learning that, uh, that they could be doing. How do they get trained? Uh, again, the typical training request is for, uh, you know, a, a fairly rigid curriculum. These are the set of things, these are the set of skills that we want people to get trained on. Um, if, it's, if it's a live, uh, a live classroom environment, then it could be a three to five day training program. Uh, we will uh, you know, put everyone into the classroom. We will have three days. Uh, you teach them for eight hours, nine hours, and they will, uh, you know, over the three days or the five days, they will learn the set of skills that we have mapped out for them at the start. If it's, uh, if it's an online training, uh, it could be sh shorter sessions of two to three hours spread over a few months. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure all of you here are familiar with, uh, with this kind of training. This is what analytics training has been for, uh, for the last uh, many, many years. And uh, this is the training uh, that we feel is, uh, this, is uh, this is the analytics training as we know it and this is surely dead. 
So I will pass the mic to uh, Shine. Okay, so um, before you go deeper into it, uh, if you're wondering, you know, kind of, therefore, what is the proposition, what we are talk talking about, let's understand a little bit of the why, you know, kind of what's happening around us. And, uh, you know, I'm definitely not going to, you know, pitch to the choir. I'm sure all of you guys have heard this many a times. But a uh, few, few things, which is, which is very important. And this is all leading to the fact that analytics training, as we all know it, is, is dead, is what we are claiming. Um, so data is, is increasingly cheap. It is ubiquitous. It is, you know, all around us. Uh, I'm sure you are tired of hearing this term, data is the new oil. It's, it's no longer the new oil. It's, I think, becoming a little older. Um, all kind of statistics around it, right? 90% of the data that we have in the world today is created in the last three months. And I'm sure this timeline is only going to become shorter because everything around us is you know, available in some form that I can really leverage, right? So everything is digital. Um, technology at the same time is allowing us not only to store this amount of data, but also to you know, crunch it and therefore you know, glean some insights out of it, which is, which is also a very important factor. As a result of which, you know, kind of, Slowly, there is, you know, there is an emergence of this concept of even a citizen data scientist. So, so what we mean is, you know, the training that was, you know, catered to probably, a, you know, kind of a group of people, to, to some of the experts and, and to, a, you know, kind of a smaller group. Now, probably everyone, and definitely the people in this room for sure, but, but every other people in your organization probably need to get, you know, kind of data smart. They need to get up to speed on, you know, leveraging data and leveraging analytics. So that is, that is really the context, that is the background. Now in that world, what do we need to do, right? I mean, it, it cannot be the, you know, the way the training has been thought about and what we have done. So how are we looking at it differently? So let's, let's look about, you know, kind of the way forward, sort of. So a digital society demands that every citizen that is part of that society is data literate. What I mean by that is every, everyone who's part of this digital, digital society uh, understands data and can make sense of, uh, make sense of this data. Uh, data literacy is a, is a key skill. It is very important for uh, competitive advantage, for agility within the organization, for the individual itself. And uh, you know, I go back to the, the concept that uh, you will all be familiar with, ESL, English as a second language. This was a concept that was popularized a uh, long time ago. I think this is being replaced by ISL, information as a second language, which means that every one of us has to have the skills to be able to deal with data. Every one of us has to be data literate. Within a business, it is no longer uh, enough for data, data savviness, data skills to be within a small silo within an organization. You know, everyone has to, uh, has to be a part of uh, uh, this revolution. Everyone has to be comfortable working with data. And how do you do that? Uh, there, are, uh, there are a few things that an organization needs to do when they, uh, 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 when they try to build this data capability. Cultural transformation is a key part of it. Uh, as I said, uh, date, knowledge about data cannot reside within silos uh, in an organization. Everyone has to talk the language of data. Uh, when someone is, uh, is presenting a hypothesis, when someone is trying to present uh, uh, a strategy, it has to be backed with data. And if it's not backed with data, then people have to question it. What that means is that data has to be embedded within the DNA of the organization, within the, uh, you know, with, with, within the culture of the organization. And uh, the only way to do this is to start at the top. The top management has to be convinced about the power of data and how it can affect their business. But that is not enough. If it's just the top management, that is not enough. It has to then percolate down to the lowest levels of the organization, which means right from the top to the bottom, everyone has to be convinced about, uh, about the data-driven culture. I uh, come from an organization, one of, my, one of the organizations that I've worked in in the past, uh, where uh, every decision from uh, the, uh, the color of the conference rooms to the food in the cafeteria, everything was data driven. There was not a single decision made which was, uh, which was not backed by data. And that's the kind of level that we, that we want to reach uh, to. And uh, this is not possible just by a cultural transformation. It has to, uh, it has to be done in conjunction with skill augmentation, uh, which means that everyone has to develop these, these skills. Now, not everyone uh, needs the same level of skills, the same kind of skills. 
how an HR person uses analytics, um, the kind of data they have and what they do with that data is going to be very different from how a marketing person uses analytics. So that distinction has to be made. Uh, you, have to, uh, you have to break down your audience, you have to segment your audience, you have to, uh, uh, you have to align them to the roles that, uh, the, the job roles that they are expected to fulfill and what are the skills that they need to uh, fulfill uh, those, uh, those job roles. Which means that you have to do a competency uh, mapping for the entire organization. You have to see what are, uh, what are the different segments within the organization, employee segments, what kind of skills do they need to be able to deliver on, um, uh, on their roles, and how do you then create custom learning paths for these people. So the, if all, each of these groups will have a different start point and a different end point. So you need to have a custom learning path that can help them on this journey. And uh, ultimately, your uh, entire training has to be mapped to this competency framework uh, that, you, that you develop. So I think this is, uh, this is about skill augmentation. Um, another very important thing that organizations are realizing is the contextualization. It is very, very important for you to be able to contextualize the skills for your learner. What I mean by that is teaching someone uh, how to use data without telling them how it would be used in their particular role, how it will, be, uh, it will help them deliver on their role better, is never going to uh, meet, your, meet your purpose. It is very, very important for everyone who's learning to understand why are they learning this and how is it going to help them in, uh, in doing their job better, in, help, in helping their organization grow. The 70-20-10 approach is a, is a great example of this. Um, the 70-20-10 approach essentially says that 10% of your learning is formal. That is what happens in a classroom. That is what happens in a training environment. 20% of your learning is social. This is what happens when you interact with your peers and your colleagues. And 70% of your learning is experiential, which means that this learning is never going to be uh, <coughs> complete till the learner actually starts using the skills that they've picked up in the training uh, and actually start working on projects and delivering on that. What this means is that if you do a training for your organization and it's not followed by each and every learner taking up some challenging assignment where they get a chance to apply the learnings that they've picked up in the training, unless you do that, the training's not going to be successful. So this approach where is what we are calling training 2.0. This is not just analytics training, this is capability built. Thanks, Gaurav. Okay, so um, I think you're, you're getting the picture of where we are getting to, right? We are talking about analytics training, as you all understand, is dead. Because, you know, the focus in our mind should be on capability built. And I know many a times it starts with the, you know, with the context of capability built. But for some reason, it, it you know, boils down to saying I need training on R or I need, you know, kind of training on Python or things like that, right? So, um, so let's, let's, you know, kind of uh, break that out a little more. Um, I know Gaurav talked a lot about, you know, how you think about training, how do you think about skill augmentation, how do you think about contextualization, you know, very, very important. How do you, you know, do the 70, 20, 10? I mean, you know, kind of the whole training that we're talking about is 10 and then there is 70, which is, you know, really doing stuff, right, in a, in a more structured manner and figuring out. So, the story is that, you know, the capability build is not just about the skill augmentation. It is about some other things, right? And, and I'm going to introduce this, you know, kind of the four S. I, I know many people here are, are tired of, you know, hearing all these four P's and five S and three T's and whatnot. But, but I, you know, cannot help but to introduce this because this is where this whole capability build as a concept, you know, kind of lies, right? So what else other than skill? Um, so there is a concept of select and I'll, I'll obviously, you know, dive a little deeper into each of them. There is something around solve, and there is something around uh, you know socialize, right? So, so the three or the four S's here are select, skill, solve, and socialize. I think we talked enough about skill, and and you know kind of this is what you know Gaurav and uh, you know Jigsaw has been obviously doing and transforming for a while. Let's highlight on a few other things, right? Which together forms this whole capability build story, and and what are they, and and how do they play a role? Let's look at uh, you know select. So I'm going to focus on select, solve, and socialize, and 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 really bring you up to speed. No, no rocket science here. I'm sure many of you know this. Do it in parts. But how do you think of it as a as a as a framework and and holistically? 
Okay, so when you say select, uh, all that I mean is that you know while we build skills, right? I mean, which is around you know hardware, software problems and things like that. It is very important to to select a few things right to to decide on what to do and what not to do, and that is where in you know, a lot of the journeys gets you know kind of in a wrong path. So how do you select a right problem that you want to solve? Sounds very trivial. You know, kind of there is business, there are problems, but no, I mean, most of the time there are plenty of problems. Which one you want to focus on now, which one you want to do later, what criteria to be applied to so selecting a right business problem is, is very important and that has to be practiced and learned. Selecting the right data for those business problems. Um, you know, a lot of people, um, you all know this fact that, you know, <coughs> a lot of the core work in analytics is obviously getting more and more automated. You know, there are enough tools, there are enough technology which is taking the burden off, you know, kind of crunching the data and doing stuff. So where do our, uh, you know, contribution lies? Our contribution lies in, you know, really thinking the problem right. In thinking about what are the different data that can be brought into play, you know, someone mentioned it that you almost have to create new business if need be to, you know, kind of generate data, to, to get data. So this is very important, right? I mean, sometimes we, you know, trivialize it and say, oh, all the data that is stored there, let me go and use it. No, you have to, you have to think about it very carefully. And needless to say, Given the plethora of, you know, kind of uh, tools out there, you know, what is happening on the technology side, it is important that we select the right tools for our purpose, not because something <coughs> is trendy, something is out there, but what my environment can support and definitely what are the right techniques and by this I mean the you know, application of, you know, math, OR, stats, whatever you are doing, so what are the right ones to use. So selecting each of them right uh, is, is a very, very important part of this overall capability that you want to build. Because even, I'm sure you've seen many cases, you know, somebody is very skilled, they're they are very good at, you know, kind of knowing, you know, what, how to do a generalist linear model using Python on a, on a very large set of data. But the problem is not getting solved, right? At the end of the day, there is a solution that we need to get it. That is not, probably because, you know, kind of select, this, you know, the, the whole ability to select is missing. Let's highlight on, on the thing that you also need to do, right, once you have built the skill. Um, I already talked about problem definition from a solve perspective. How do you not only select the right problem, but define it right, which is very, very important. How do you really design the right solution, right? Um, a solution design is, is, is so much more of an art and then not just the science, right? It is not about just running the algorithms. It is about a lot more. It is about how do you bring, you know, kind of the right data together. And it is about how do you, you know, kind of go about really finding a solution. How do you do it in an agile mode? How do you, you know, create something in the first few weeks and then you know, slowly build your overall solution. So solution design is very critical in this path of solve. And, and needless to see, you know, kind of how do you really analyze? Um, and what I mean by here is, is not, again, not the, not the technique part which you have already talked about. And it is about, you know, the, some, of the, some of the best practices. How do you analyze data? How do you look at it? Um, you know, very, very important that, you know, how do you really get this results that you are creating out to the audience? How do you present it right, how do you do the right storyboarding, how do you generate the right insights. Some of the things in, you know, kind of today as we, you know, go <laughs> deeper into data science, talk about a lot of fancy stuff out there, I think sometimes gets missed out. And, and, and believe me, you know, kind of with all these years that I've been trying to do something in this field, I see many a times the gaps are in some of these, you know, not, not necessarily in terms of, you know, the, the algorithm or the tool or the technology, you know, they're, they're probably doing everything right. So finally, you know, kind of how do you ensure that this work that gets done uh, will, will actually be consumed, right? Will, will actually, people will actually take it. Uh, extremely critical. We need to think about that upfront. Uh, and this is a capability, by the way, right? I mean, it's not enough to say, you know, I have data, I have a problem, I have solved the problem, right? You know, now you figure out what you want to do. So if I am, you know, kind of owning that solution, it is very important that I think about the final, you know, kind of the consumption of that. And that's, you know, kind of what we, you know, kind of do iteratively because if you figure out that there's a problem at the last mile on the consumption, then you come back and design the, you know, design the solution differently or define the problem differently. So that's something that I you know, thought is very important that you select a few things right, you build the right skills in, a, in an experiential manner, you, you know, kind of know how to solve a problem. And then finally, you know, what I talked about the consumption and feedback leads to a very important aspect of, of socializing, right? Um, I, I'm sure many of the, you know, the, the purists and many of the hardcore data scientists would say, what are you talking about? You know, that's, that's not, you know, kind of uh, my role. But believe me, you know, that is where 
the real value is in established when you really socialize and I am talking about obviously in a in an enterprise context right where it is not just you it is many other people who are going to be touched by their solution who is going to implement so how do you make you know kind of um, you know the consumers or who are going to use that analysis you are building a you know uh, some kind of a recommender engine there are people who are going to finally go and implement it how do you make them your champions how do you, you know kind of quantify the impact of this one it is not enough to say that i have used the best technique it is giving me great lift that's fine but how do you really quantify the the you know kind of the impact that is going to create and then clearly you know kind of buy in I'm sure many of you think, you know, what is that? <laughs> you know, kind of, uh, you know, unless you have the right buy-in, believe me, it will remain a cool algorithm that is, you know, kind of written in a nice piece of, and maybe stored somewhere in the GitHub, or, you know, kind of, I may be, you know, kind of creating a good, you know, great deck, great presentation, but nothing after that. So that's, you know, kind of the world that we are talking about in terms of, you know, kind of uh, socialize. So select, skill, solve, socialize, all the four, has to play together to you know kind of really bring this capability built to life right i mean that is that is a point that i wanted to make so let's you know kind of just look at let's summarize all of these and and then see you know kind of what are probably a few takeaways i'm sure you know kind of all of us are in this all sessions you know sometimes looking for you know kind of what can i take away what can i go and implement so there are these five golden rules that you know kind of we thought about and i think gaurav can yeah. take us to that yeah so these are what we call the five commandments if you are uh, looking to build uh, analytics capability within your organization. Uh, the first commandment, data is a life skill. Data is not a niche skill. Data is not a skill that should reside within a small uh, team within your organization. Everyone has to talk the language of data. Data is a life skill. Information is your competitive advantage. All businesses are realizing that information is the biggest competitive advantage they can have, especially in today's world. Um, information is, and the use of information effectively is what differentiates a good business, a great business from a good business. Data-driven decision-making cannot happen in silos. I have worked with enough organizations now to realize that uh, if you are just uh, looking at uh, building a small data science team, even if they are the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, the most experienced, the best data scientists you can get, if you are building a small silo within your organization, it's not going to work out. Uh, everyone has to talk the language of data. Everyone has to understand that data-driven decisions are indeed uh, better decisions. Analytics training is not enough. Again, coming from an analytics company, analytics training company, this is a bold statement, but this is what we have seen across multiple clients. Just training by itself is not enough. It has to be uh, complemented with the 4S framework. You have to talk about selecting the right problem, skilling your people, solving the problem, and uh, socializing it. Again, uh, cannot uh, overemphasize the importance of socializing the results. Um, part of what we do in, in our uh, trainings when we engage with businesses is um, you know, uh, looking at uh, one of the metrics that we look at is how many requests are coming to their IT team or the data science team post the training. Have we been able to excite people about, uh, about this and are they reaching out to other teams, are they reaching out to their colleagues to, uh, um, you know, to ask for uh, more, uh, more analytics. So this is essentially the, uh, you know, the five commandments we have. Uh, we feel uh, the <coughs> analytics training as we've known it over the last 10 years is truly dead and buried. Uh, we feel uh, the time of we came, we trained, we left, that time has gone. That doesn't, uh, doesn't work now. Uh, now it's the time for analytics capability build, which is a lot more strategic and truly transformative for the organization. Thank you. Um, so, so, so far you've uh, heard from people who've been, uh, you know, who've been helping businesses build the analytics capability. What we wanted to do is uh, have you hear uh, directly from a business about how they've gone about and, uh, and done this. So we have Chaturanga here from MAS um, from Sri Lanka. He's, uh, he's come to, uh, you know, to talk about his experience. Chaturanga, please. Thank you, Gaurav. Good morning, everyone. All right, so uh, I think uh, this is my uh, second cyber experience. Last year, we came here 
Um, one question was asked by uh, some of the people outside was, uh, we thought this was Indian uh, conference, and I think, no, it's international. Because we come from Sri Lanka here to learn from your experience because you have gone miles ahead on this data science journey. So we are very uh, young, but uh, progressively coming up on this journey, but we don't want to go, uh, we want to learn from the best and we want to learn from your experiences and where you have gone wrong, where you have succeeded, so we won't uh, take a longer path. So our requirement is shorter uh, period, the right way of implementing data science. So last year we came and this year uh, it's very exciting to present our journey in front of you and I think uh, this story, what Uh, what I would be sharing, maybe answering some of the questions we had yesterday. The questions around, do I hire a data scientist? What is data science? Is AI the only thing that we can uh, pursue? It? Are we moving from descriptive to AI? How fast we go? So, and apart from that, how do you really create a culture around data is what we've been trying to do. And uh, this team realizes that what we are doing uh, there at MS Holdings resonates with the, uh, the five commandments uh, which was presented earlier. So uh, let me uh, uh, briefly tell you about what MS Holdings is. We are the largest apparel manufacturer in South Asia. Uh, we, have, uh, we, are, we have 52, uh, 53 facilities across 15 nations and we are uh, powered with uh, 97,000 plus workforce. So yesterday, uh, they are on the comedy, it says HR is cutting cake. For us, it's not. Uh, for us, it's about strategic HR. We are managing 97,000 people. And we've just crossed $1.8 billion in revenue. And also, uh, we have 30 years of manufacturing experiences behind us. So every day we come to work, all of us, to inspire, innovate, and create value, and respect humanity. That is what we live by. We will always live by where we go on that. And today, uh, we, are the, we are the largest uh, supplier for Victoria's Secret, Nike, Lululemon, Gap, and Triumph, and Speedo across the globe. And you might have touched and filled Amante in India. So that is a maze brand. So let me briefly tell you about why we are going into analytics. Right, we started in 1985 with 50 man factory, the chairman Mr. Mahesh Amalian and his brothers. So we came a long journey with a lot of partnerships and in 2000, we got a similar concepts or similar idea about this data or digital like that in those days which is called lean manufacturing. So our teams went to Japan, learned lean manufacturing and we embraced lean manufacturing. So Lean is our culture, our DNA, we walk, uh, we, we go waste walking, we do problem solving and continuous improvement is what we always talk about. So when we came on the lean journey, there was a period that we want to embrace the other competitive advantages like innovation, building innovation capabilities across the organization which can help our consumers and automation to improve our efficiency. So during 2012 and uh, up to 2012, we did backward forward integration, near shore, offshore. Ha uh, proud to say we are producing garments in US now the, from this year. Uh, and uh, we have moved the operational excellence curve. So there's a linear growth in operational excellence, but now we see there's an exponential opportunity. That exponential uh, opportunity is coming through digital. So our future is going to be digital. And for digital, we need to build capabilities. So digital means data, and if you are not using data to make meaning or make uh, outcomes, we would not be competitively advantaged. So as we go around the 2021, where we want to be is an AI-enabled manufacturer. We want to move from siloed linear manufacturing to adaptive manufacturing, which cut across the whole value chain. And we are going to uh, do dynamic uh, fulfillment which is one click, one supply, B to C from vendors to direct to consumer, and we are in the journey of monetizing our 30 years of ex manufacturing experience, and we will be supporting micro 
multinationals. So this is why we need analytics and digital capabilities within our organization. So there is a larger purpose for analytics at MAS. So in, in a very brief way, I will explain to you what I feel as data science and what MAS as a person who leads data science at MAS believes. So there is these two things, right? There is data and there's science. So we all talked about data yesterday and there's unstructured, structured, all these data is there lying on the, uh, uh, the processors. And there's science. The science is what we learned in, uh, when we were very young in school days. Uh, it is about finding a problem, defining an uh, experiment, doing it and um, uh, finding, coming to a conclusion uh, and implementing it. But from that 7th grade till I am, uh, so till 30 to 20 years we have not used science. In our education science was not part of it. We were taught to do things, we were th taught to do uh, exams, but science was taken out. So we are combining these two together at MAs, saying you have data, if anybody is using it scientifically and that's going to help you to make better decisions, that's data science for us in a very simple context. So it's a, even a pie chart is data science for us, even algorithm or AI algorithm is data science for us. So how did we go about last three years creating this culture? So as I mentioned to you early, our HR is not cake cutting HR, we are strategic HR. So where we started analytics was in HR, right? So this is a very uh, uh, funny equation for all the consultants who engage with them is why the hell you start at analytics at HR, right? So we normally do at marketing or we do normally do at, so we started at the heart of our value addition. Our heart of value addition is 91,000 workforce on the shop floor, the manufacturing workforce. So we had to do something for them to make their life easy, make their earnings greater, make the productivity come through that needle point. So when we went about this journey, how we went about is what resonates today as a successful story for me to share with you. So when we started analytics, we didn't talk about predictive analytics, we just went to the areas of HR to see how they do stuff. So we asked what are their problems and as soon as they told the problems, we saw they are not using right data, they are not using connected data, they are not visualizing their data so that it can make their life easy. So we sat there with them months, weeks or even years to help them structure and make their life easy the structure the data. So it's about nothing high tech, it's Excel sheets, it's SharePoint and it's OneDrive. So we structured whatever the data that was everywhere into one place and we gave them power with data through a self-service BI. So we are the earliest adopter of Power BI uh, probably in this region. We, uh, we, have a, uh, we started in 2015 and what is the benefit we gave was zero reporting, right? That was the greatest win for everybody. So as soon as you structure data, you connect it to a self-service BI, their reporting became zero. So we saved their two hours to zero. So they started loving analytics. So everybody said, why don't you come to our uh, department? Why don't you come to our organization? So every month we had a request. So based on that, the management saw the power. We got the management buy-in. We expanded the team, so today I have 30 members working on analytics from two members and we started exponentially training uh, self-service BI. We have 600 Power BI users now and we build a data science team which is we have a central team today. So this is how we kind of brought the culture into it. So at MAS, um, I said I'm talking about HR, we have a competency framework. We have 44 job families, 1,200 unique jobs. For each of these unique jobs, we have a job profile and a competency framework. So we have two types of competencies. One is called professional competency, which everybody should have. The other one is technical competency, where based on your job role you will have. So we found this very interesting uh, professional competency at MAs, which is called analytical skills. So this was supposed to be everybody's uh, skill. Every executive, we have 8,500 executives, has to have this skill. So when we really read the uh, fine line, 
So, at level 3, you are supposed to create logical implications to predict possible consequences, right? So, uh, this is data science for me, right? But at this, uh, at our organization, it was more about people who are good at Excel was marked at level 5. So, now we are rechanging it, re-looking at this. Now, we are using this framework. Uh, so, at level 5, you are doing complex problem solving, what we talked yesterday about AI and all these algorithmic stuff. So, on technical competency, yesterday somebody asked, should I hire a data scientist? No, we are not hiring data scientists only. For our technical capabilities, this is the uh, six roles we have identified. So, myself is a data evangelist who talk about data and getting people on board. So, we have data engineers who structure data and help us to do that. We have data, uh, data architects who solution the data and we have uh, hired the first data scientist after four years of this journey last month. Um, and we have a data artist who creates stuff visually appealing to people and we have number of data analysts. So, with this team, we have a purpose. We, we know why we do analytics at MAs. We are doing it for six reasons. We want to move to industry 4.0, which is a data smart factory. We want to keep improving talent analytics, which is people analytics. Consumer analytics is going to be big because we are going from B to C. And data driven design is going to change the game for us to work with any uh, brand we work with. And AI enablement will be our next game changer to move to adaptive manufacturing. And capacity building is how I and my team keep on coaching, keep on training the rest of the group in the organization. So, we talk about numbers. Yesterday, somebody asked how many in the team we should have. And this is the number of data team that we are going to have within next three years. So, we have Power BI developers, we had zero, uh, now we have 400 and we are moving it up to 1000 by 2021. We have analytics community who does analytics stuff, we have eight now and we are moving it to 90 and we have a central team that is my team which started with two interns, now uh, we have seven and we are going it up to only 10. So, the central team is going to be maximum 10 and data smart executives. We have about 100 now, we want to make it 5000 and people on the shop floor who really solve problems, they need to be data smart and enabled on their fingertips and we need 50,000 out of 91,000 to be that. So, this is a numbers game and this is the scale that we are looking at and it is not about the core, right. So, uh, we think data is going to change how we do things and we have a purpose so we are building capability as Gaurav rightly said it's about capability building because whatever we say somebody has to use it and if they are not using it there's no point we are giving solutions and if we are we should not be the people who will go and say look you can do this you can do this they should be the people who can come and ask us can we do this so, lean has become our DNA today. We talk about problem solving and continuous improvement across the. So, by 2021, our expectation is the people on the shop floor will ask, come, can you do a clustering? Can you do a segmentation? Can we do optimization? Can you do a visualization? I want the team members on the ground to come and ask management that question. So, this is how we are going about it. So, if you are to start analytics in an organization, right? Right, So, there is these three things that you need to start building and it is not going to happen overnight and we have done it over 30 years. Right, So, the vision and purpose for analytics, I think it is very clear for you. MS has a real good vision why you need analytics on what we do, what we want to do strategically uh, for the future. So, it is easy to get align leadership. Look, you want to do adaptive manufacturing, it is about data, it is about data structures, it is about analytics. So, if you do not invest today, you are not going to get adaptive manufacturing. So, they are very clear about it. And this lean DNA is helping data science enormously because lean talks about problem solving. So, when you say problem solving, root cause analysis, data and structured data to solve problems continuously. And we invested in innovation culture. So, there is an opportunity to challenge 
challenge the status quo, do things differently. Anybody can come up to the leadership and say what you are doing is wrong. So this is a great enabler for data science. So that is the culture that is going to help us here. And the last piece is ability to build capability. So you need to have a proper framework, a learning organization. Myself is, has not done anything related to statistics or data science. Um, I'm a finance graduate, but my organization gave me opportunity to learn this. So we are coming to conferences, we are tapping into LinkedIn, YouTube to learn Power BI. So our organization learning organization. As you learn, they appreciate. So all of us are really in geared to learn. So it is a competency-based skilling and as well as a learning organization. So when we looked around last year, the real uh, gain for me from uh, Cyper was the learnings you have shared over five years as well as meeting of Jigsaw Academy because uh, we felt the, the thinking they have, which was presented earlier, is aligned to the thinking that we have. So we wanted a partner who is on a platform, who is scalable to our needs and also who thinks alike. So we can do customized solution uh, uh, programs next year. So this is basically how we believe we can move uh, to the next level. And I hope I have answered some of the uh, questions that was everybody is trying to answer yesterday about data science, uh, AI and the, the size of the team. Um, so we will uh, uh, wrap up this session uh, basically with this uh, case study.